Okay, so I'm speaking about kind of a slightly different topic, still I guess within the frame of identity um, and social questions, social issues. So I'm just going to start, I'm going to do a bit of a Malinowski and I'm going to ask you to imagine being somewhere. Um, imagine summer 2011, Kinshasa, it's the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the second largest city in Africa. Now, every evening on television screens throughout the city, the same agonizing spectacle would appear twice. At the beginning and end of the popular news bulletin called Kin Makambo, Kinshasa's problems. So we'd see a frantic, shirtless young man protesting against the cruelty of the police chief who has just arrested him along with an accomplice. And he cries, Mukunzi ya volunte mabe, means chief of ill will. So to Kinwa, who would watch Kinwa as the residents of Kinshasa, this shirtless young man and his accomplice were immediately identifiable as Kuluna. Now, the word Coluna, it comes from the Portuguese Coluna, column, as in infantry column. And it's entered the Kinshasa vocabulary by Congolese diamond traffickers returning from Angola. But from around 2007, the Congolese media started to speak of Phenomen Coluna, which refers to the apparent emergence of territorial gangs, or Ecuri in French, meaning stables, of youth in certain areas of Kinshasa. These Coluna, it was being reported, were making disorder in different neighbourhoods throughout the city, carrying out street raids and robberies, armed with clubs, broken bottles, and most notably machetes, by day as well as by night. The government and police were apparently unable to contain these activities, and phenomen Kuluna seemed to be spreading across the city and getting rapidly out of control. The Kinoa media spoke of phenomen Kuluna as expressive of la deprivation des mains, the breakdown of norms, a social crisis described as omnipresent, but particularly manifest in the moral corruption of youth. So it's a kind of narrative that we might be quite familiar with in discussions of the riots or the discourse of broken Britain, but not necessarily identical. Now, how should the anthropologist understand all this? Why did the activities of these young people become such a, such a widely discussed phenomenon? Now, in my full study, I analyze a whole variety of representations of phenomenon Kuluna, including popular discourses, media, state, what NGOs and Pentecostal Christian churches say about it. <coughs> in this paper, I'm just going to focus not on Phenomen Kaluna as a, as a set of discourses, but on the ethnographic exploration of the ideas and practices of Kaluna themselves. Because while Phenomen Kaluna might have been a sort of phenomenon, a moral panic, or something that was represented in the media, the Kaluna themselves were no mere construction. In poor areas throughout Kinshasa, self proclaimed Kaluna were a very real presence. And in the area, the area where I lived, Kitambo, I came quickly into contact with the my local Ecuador. So this is the kind of uh, images you see all the time in the media, including circulated among the Congolese diaspora in London, and websites. Cartoons <coughs> addressing this. Okay, so in the avenue where I lived, uh, the local Ecuador was called Batayon Buzoba Banamura, which means the Battalion of Foolishness, the Presidential Guard. And they, they were the ones who claimed to make the law. Now, uh, their leader was a guy called General Malimo. That was the name he took, and he was age 17. <coughs> who were these Kaluna? And under what sorts of circumstances had they developed this ambition to make the law? Now, just briefly, routes into Kaluna is varied. So m many came from situations of dire need, effectively abandoned by their parents. Becoming a Kaluna was a means of getting the money to eat. <coughs> But others came from situations of relative stability, and they've been attracted to joining their curie just out of a desire to protect family members from the attacks of Kuluna who came from other areas. In almost all cases, Kuluna did live with families or at least had somewhere to sleep at night, which kept them within a symbolically critical inch of homelessness in the state of being the status of being a shehe or a street kid. Now, one of the most striking features of of the uh, Batayon Buzoba, this, this group, was its self-conscious imitation of military structures. Its members shared a preoccupation quite general among Kaluna, with the soldier as a figure of power and a model of masculinity. A common synonym for the Ekuri was battalion, as in military battalion, and all the Ekuris I worked with were headed by a general, and they took on the vestiges of a military structure featuring positions such as corporal, sergeant, the lowest rank being soda, soldier, or Kadogo, child soldier. Uh, they showed a big preoccupation with uh, this issue of leadership, which 
in Kinshasa, that's the English word is used. Uh, it was always crucial that the authority of the general was not undermined by insubordinate, insubordinate members, who sometimes it was worried that they might try and keep proceeds from raid for themselves, rather than rendering it to the leader to be redistributed. But it's also pointed out by people in Kinshasa that um, this kind of engagement with, with military uh, metaphors is not just a part of a general uh, preoccupation with leadership, but it's also an imaginative playing out of the civil war which took place from the late 90s to the, uh, to the first half of the, 20, the, the, the decade that just finished. Um, several kids I spoke to were keen to point out that yeah, this mimesis worked not only at the level of names, but also at the level of practices, including the practice with which Kuno was most closely associated, which is the use of machetes. So they suggested that this could be understood as an imitation of the policy of kata kata, cut cut, which was well remembered policy from the time of the Civil War when the capital was being subjugated by uh, the Kabila, the father, the father of the current president. Now, another central aspect of the Ekeris was their territoriality. Um, this is actually a, a, a 50s map of the city when it's still colonial period, but you can see these are kind of so city indigen. So these were suburbs which were built in the 50s uh, by the Belgian government specifically for uh, African migrants because um, they, they didn't want them to live in the centre of the town, which is here. And to this day, and this, this is the area where kind of Benamanguna is said to have arisen. This area is called Yolo. And um, you can see how it's structured in kind of quarters like this. Um, so while it's worth being sceptical about the kind of analyses of urban African culture that obsess over deep continuities with a supposedly authentic pre-colonial past, what I think is the case is that both Kuluna and a lot of commentators in Kinshasa imagine that their territorial violence is in some sense a return to a non-urban or wild or state of nature-like space. So both self proclaimed Kuluna and other commentators frequently compared these practices to, to those of animals in the forest, Banyama. The aspiration to make the law, um, which Akiris expressed, can be understood as following Hansen and Steppert Pact, a kind of informal sovereignty, making the law involved, imposing tolls on outsiders passing through a territory for the right to use a footbridge or to promote a commercial product, commercial product. And the imitation of legalistic procedure of the state was particularly clear in the practice of producing letters to Baga, fight letters in which a fight between two Ikuri would be formally proposed. Uh, in this imitation of formal legal documents, they would always be computer typed, printed out and signed. Now, the Ikuris, they're no anarchist communes. They didn't refuse the authority of the state on ideological grounds, and their hierarchical structures suggested a, a mimesis rather than a rejection of state institutions. However, insofar as they inspired, aspired to make the law in their territories, the sovereignty of the state was nevertheless being contested. Now, my attention to the figure of the general as an exemplar of leadership and to the curious exercising kind of informal sovereignty shouldn't imply that these colonies were simply about a quest for power. Now, the emergence of this practice on the background of poverty and need, uh, and in the terms used by Kuna themselves, zela, or hunger, uh, should not be ignored. The effects of uh, prolonged economic crisis on the standards of living in Kinshasa have been well documented. There's a popular joke that refers to <coughs> the imaginary 15th article of the Constitution that is dead weird and get by, fend for yourselves. And the turn to Kulunaj among young men could be interpreted as just a kind of logical, if violent, extension of this principle. Um, I remember uh, one occasion when Junior, who's a 26 year old Kuluna, I got to know quite well, he was an enthusiastic member of the Quiet in the Pentecostal church where he attended, and often he'd sat, happily sit outside his, his shack singing along with popular Christian songs. But meanwhile, his brother would be sitting next to him sharing a drunk with his prostitute girlfriend. And um, Eugenia was evidently embarrassed by what he perceived as a kind of incongruous juxtaposition of the godly and the worldly, which is a much used opposition in Kinshasa. But he reported with irony that Kaluna would, they would often go to church, join in the songs and the prayers. Then on leaving the service, they'd go to a, another area outside their own and commit a violent attack to get some money. 
and the pastors were not indifferent. They would advise young men to stop these activities. But, as Junior said, Kasisoki to tika to If we stop, what are we going to eat? So insisting analytically on the importance of hunger and refusing to reduce Kalinaj to a play of science doesn't imply that the material immediacy of hunger is somehow less cultural and more natural than the will to power. Uh, treating hunger as itself culturally meaningful allows us to begin finding a way out of the impasse between sort of facile, romantic uh, visions of poverty where they're poor but happy, and then kind of problematically dehumanizing perspectives that you get in humanitarian discourse where they live in something less than life because they're poor and deprived. Um, you know, we don't need to choose between poverty as kind of Bactinian creative scenario or Agambe and bare life, you know. Rather, we can, if we, you know, look at suffering as, as culturally meaningful in itself, recognizing that bare life is never truly really bare, then we can understand how it is that both of these pictures seem to carry something. And one way of <coughs> looking at hunger, which looms large, large in popular Kinwa experience and also the popular imagination, um, the big hit song in 2011, called Techno Malewa, which means cheap street restaurant, had the chorus, I eat, I eat, but I'm not full, mama, I want to eat. So talk in hunger, talk about hunger, it can be understood as not just an expression of despair, but also a political discontent. Um, as people has described, the expression we are hungry emerges frequently in popular discussion, evaluating the current president, Kabila. Um, and the hunger can be described as a kind of embodied outcome of a malfunctioning state. People tend to speak nostalgically of a good, a beautiful era um, under the time of Mbutu, when everyone could afford to eat three times a day with ease. This is maybe a bit of nostalgia. But people say, governed by a good father, one is never hungry. So the kind of complaints about hunger that Kaluna make, and the majority of Kaluna make in this context, can be understood as calls on leaders and the state to fulfill their obligation to provide. And these kind of comments, complaints are clearly audible in songs that Kaluna would produce, which could be quite successful in local areas. Um, and an example is the chorus of one song by a Kaluna group, where they, it goes, Papa and Mama sold the compound because they wanted the money. The children find themselves on the street. The child we hoped in our hearts would one day become a minister. Night and day smokes weed, the smoke rises up. The ancestors died from smoking weed. If you give, we eat. If you don't give, we won't eat. So it's a kind of declaration of dependence, um, which could give us a different way of thinking about uh, resistant political discourses. But anyway, I mean, this, is, this cartoon is interesting because it's, it's playing with the idea of who is a real Kuluna. You can see here, uh, this is a reference to the Minister of Justice, Luzolo Bambi, who introduced a kind of zero tolerance policy. And he's saying, this, uh, he's sending this Kuna off to, to jail for 20 years. And here's the, the president eating away at the kind of state coffers. And he's saying, the real wrongdoers are, are these Kaluna children. But as the cartoonist makes quite clear, um, the Kaluna himself is quite a small, vulnerable, skinny figure. And often this is how they work. And I meant it. For all their fierce representation, they tend to be quite small minority boys. Um, whereas this politician is clearly uh, profiting from state money for his own benefit. Now, okay, there's a, a lot of questions we could address, but I mean, I guess one, one question you might address is to what degree can you understand that Kaluna is an identity, a kind of oppositional subculture? I think for the minute, the question of subculture is just interesting, but were they in any sense oppositional? Uh, they were certainly spoken about, spoken of themselves as rebels against parental authority. They sometimes blame their frustrations on a lack of family dialogue, and frequently there are occasions when Kaluna would use accusations of witchcraft against uncles and elder people at the funerals of young men who had died as a pretext for kind of going to the funeral and creating disorder and, and mugging people. Um, in their songs, there would sometimes be quite uh, explicit critiques of the current state of affairs. Uh, notably a line from a 2009 hit where they say, one would have said that this is not even a real country. So messed up. But despite these critical moments, I wouldn't I would have really have said that Kaluna were social bandits in a sort of Hobbes-Bormian sense. Um, their aspiration to make the law may have posed a challenge of sovereignty, but they did not fundamentally challenge its legitimacy because they were sort of imitating its traffics all the time. 
Um, and their songs contain a great emphasis on the plea to <coughs> fulfill obligations and on the critique of authority itself. As, in, as England has argued, such pleas can't be too easily dismissed as a pathological clamour for dependence, and attempts that might allow us to sort of get beyond uh, popular post-colonial reading of, 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 of post-colonial Africa is dominated by mutual zombification. But at the same time, I think it's also important to consider the possibility that the very desire of these young men for leaders to fulfill <coughs> on their obligations did make them easy to exploit politically. Um, there's a lot of anxiety in Kinshasa that Kaluna were getting used by state and opposition parties to uh, take part in <laughs> to take part in, um, in electoral, pre-electoral violence. Um, often when you go and visit Kaluna, they'd be wearing the yellow t-shirts that the, <coughs> that, the, um, that the government had given them for this big state conference. Um, I mean, wearing these t-shirts didn't necessarily equal political support, but um, obviously they were quite easy to buy. Um, and they even, so there was a popular anxiety to charge about even though Kaluna were sort of abandoned by the state, they were also being exploited by it. But I think there's one aspect of the Kaluna lifestyle that deserves comment as oppositional, which is their association with the use of drugs, which is not a kind of status symbol in Kinshasa, but represents them more as sort of a way of getting inebriated and a necessary tool for, um, for, for carrying out nighttime attacks when you're a bit high and you weren't, you weren't thinking straight. Um, and this involved the consumption of cocaine, which is very expensive in Kinshasa. And it might seem surprising that these, these guys who are obviously so poor were expending a, big, a lot of their monthly income on, on cocaine. But this pattern of extravagant spending, in fact, was central to the dynamic, because Karina spoke of the money taken from a robbery as Mongo Yadisumu, it's the money of sin, which you, you couldn't really accumulate. You had to spend it quickly or, or lend it to <coughs> friends. Um, and this. This, in fact, created the motivation to go and do another job. Um, so this created, really, at the risk of appearing a bit of a critical social scientist, a, 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 a cycle which was destructive not only to other people but to themselves. So I think we might argue that if the Karina were emerging as, in any sense, an opposition to subculture, uh, they showed, nevertheless, a greater capacity for participating in anti-opposition violence they have been paid to, rather than any kind of revolutionary insurrection. You might want to, people have tried to read, for example, the UK riots in language. So yeah, lots of issues, not really much time, but thank you.